Restoring Place Church, the church of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Dream Center, is a place where we make disciples of Christ, teach and train them to live as children of God, and to thrive in who He created them to be. We believe that this is the best time on earth to be alive, to experience the end time harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Get ready to be renewed, recharged, and restored to go out and take the gospel to your world. Let's join our service already in progress. Everything on this earth is a reaction to the Word of God. Come on, come on. The earth, the rocks, the animals, they don't have a choice. They obey. They do what the Word says. But for us, humanity, He created us in His image and His likeness. Amen. We were created in His likeness and His image. We're like him. Now, we fell away when we moved apart from his truth. The moment that we fell outside of his truth, death came. Death came. And the soul that sins shall die, that is the will of God, but that's not the will of God for humanity. That's not the will of God for you and me. Amen. He came that we might have life Woo! and have it more than more than enough. He wants you to have abundant life. Good news. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he would destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. And everything that Jesus did was a perfect reflection of the Father. Amen. I don't think any of us have a hard time believing that Jesus wants us to be healed, but a whole lot of us don't think God wants us to be healed. To the point that some people watching this or even maybe even here today, you may get upset when I say God wants you to be healed. God desires for you to be well yes. Hallelujah. and prosperous and have a soul, sound mind. Amen. Amen. He doesn't want you to have a oppression, depression. He doesn't want you to be uh, in bipolar or schizophrenia or have uh, deep, dark thoughts. He wants you to think about good things. He wants you to live a, a good life. He wants you to be blessed. Come on. In fact, everything he needs to bless you with all that heaven contains, he's already done it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, this is I still, I'm still trying to dig it out, but Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies will be made his footstool. Woo. We have this thinking, I think, in the modern church here that Jesus is going to come back in the nick of time and save us. He's already done it. He's seated until, he's seated until his enemies are under his feet. Come on, come on. That means before he gets up, the enemy is going to be under his feet. Well, who's going to subdue the enemy? Wow. God and his church. Woo! Those that are alive on this earth that have a legal right to be here, Once your physical body dies, you, you don't have a legal right to be here anymore. You're going to be with the Lord. Amen. But we will come back and rule and reign with him. Amen. And that's going to be a glorious day. Oh. He's given the church authority to operate on this earth. Yes. Most people don't even ever seek it, know about it, think about it. For so long, yeah. we've... And I know this is the best thing that we can do is get people saved, born again. Because Jesus said, if, you don't get, if you're not born again, you'll never partake of and see into this kingdom. Come on. This kingdom that we carry in us. It's not out there. We don't have to go get him from heaven and bring him down. We have to go to get Jesus from the bowels of this earth and bring him up. But the word is nigh thee in your Woo! mouth. The word of faith which we preach. Amen. It's in our mouth. It's in our heart. Hallelujah. The kingdom is right here with us. Glory. We keep going and looking for the kingdom. The kingdom is right here. Oh, and Jesus, when he said, made disciples, he said, go into these towns and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Yes. And heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils and cleanse lepers. For a lot of religious leaders, they didn't like what Jesus was doing in healing people. In fact, they got mad. 
And I guarantee you, some watching online, we're going to pray for you. But if it makes you uneasy to talk about healing as part of the body of Christ, well, you're just like the religious leaders of Jesus' day who got mad because he healed, and particularly because sometimes he would heal on the Sabbath day. <laughs> Couldn't seize and wouldn't seize. I'm going to read you something from Matthew's account because at the first Sunday of every month, we, we claim that it's a healing service. And if, you, uh, if you're watching by line and you want to come and, and be healed or have someone pray for you, not ask God for, but heal you, then we're here every Sunday. And every Sunday we pray for the sick. Every Sunday we curse cancer. But every, the first Sunday of the month is, is dedicated to healing, physical healing in our bodies. In Jesus' day, they came to him begging for mercy. What were they wanting? Healing. Bartimaeus on the side of the road. Jesus, son of David, which meant he knew who he was. Son of David, son of man, or son of God, or the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. Amen. Have mercy on me. He yelled it again. The Syrophoenician woman comes to him. Jesus, son of David, my daughter is at home, vexed with a demon spirit. Have mercy on us. What does she want? Heal it. Do you know healing is mercy for humanity? It's mercy. Oh, that men would praise God for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. His mercy endures forever. Well, if they wanted healing and they asked for mercy, his mercy endures forever. His healing endures forever. Amen. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He didn't change because he left this earth, but he empowered the church to carry on the things that he'd done himself on this earth. And he called us to step in behind him and do what he did. Amen. In fact, he even said if we believe on him, we'd do the works he did in greater works because he's going to be with the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Philip said, that Lord, just show us the Father will be satisfied. He says, how long have I been with you, Philip? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, again, when I study the Gospels and the, the New Testament, I see Jesus as healer. We call him Christ the healer. But he said himself, I can do nothing by myself. But he wasn't by himself. In fact, it wasn't Jesus, the man that healed. It was the Holy Spirit that dwelt upon him, which is the Spirit of God, who is our healer. God is our healer. Amen. He says that in, in Exodus. I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of your wounds, he said in Jeremiah. He is our healer. Amen. And he longs for us to walk in divine health. He also wants us to be saved yes. and be forgiven. Amen. 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 Look at uh, Matthew chapter 9. I'll read a little bit from this. Jesus got into the boat and returned it to what was considered his hometown, Capernaum. And just then, some people brought a paralytic man to him lying on a sleeping mat. When Jesus perceived the, the, their strong faith within their hearts, he said to the paralyzed man, my son, be encouraged, for your sins have been forgiven. Now, they brought this man who needed healing, and he told this man, your sins are forgiven. They, these words promote, uh, prompted some of the religious leaders who were present to think, Why, who, who can do this? This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus supernaturally perceived their thoughts, and he said to them, why do you envy with such evil in your hearts? Why do you care, excuse me, such evil in your hearts? 
Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to stand up and walk? Which is easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or stand up and walk? That's what the Lord said. Which is easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or that you're healed? His words never change. We today in the 21st century understand that we can be born again because we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. We've heard the gospel truth. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that God raised him from the dead, and that he's become Lord of our life, and then we're born again because we believe something that God said and told us. And here Jesus is saying, which is easier for me to say, that your sins are forgiven, or that you're healed. Wow, wow. They had a hard time understanding their sins could be forgiven in those days. They had spent year upon year of animal blood sacrifices to cleanse them, and they never really did it because they had to do it again next year. It was not <laughs> the final thing, but when Jesus shed his blood for us, it was done. No more need for animal sacrifice because finally, it hasn't been atoned anymore. It's been it's completely taken care of. As far as the east is from the west, God has removed our sins and our transgressions from us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. But today we wonder, does God still heal? Of course he does. I would say that if you call upon him, he'll answer you. Because he said he would. I think every time we come together, if you ask him for something that he's already given you, he said, yes, it's yours. It belongs to you. Amen. <laughs> 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. There again, your sins are forgiven and your body's healed. And don't forget that he cares about your mind too. Whatever thing that's going on in our minds, whatever things that pull us down, oppress us, depress us, enslave us, Hold us in bondage mentally. He's freed us. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul, which is your mind, you will, and your emotions, they prosper. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. And then the scripture also encourages, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> we've been invited to have the mind of Christ, have the mind of the anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? Wow, wow. And what he did was reflect the Father everywhere he went. Wow. He reflected the Father. He's never changed. Never changed once. Go back to First Peter, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we, dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. Or as past tense. We have been healed. healed. Well, Brother Noble, I don't feel it in my body. It doesn't make any difference. You will have what your faith receives. And you have the faith of God. The faith you have, though it may not be as big as you want it, but Jesus said you don't have to have all that kind of faith, Peter. You don't need to increase your faith if you only had mustard seed faith. And he's not saying, I would, wouldn't you one day love to have as much faith as a grain of mustard seed? In fact, that's the smallest seed of all. Why would he pick the smallest seed of all to say that's what you ought to ascribe to? That's what you ought to, that should be your pinnacle. No. He's saying if I took all the faith you had, Peter, and whittled it down to only mustard seed faith. It is the faith of God and it's enough faith to tell that mountain to move and it would obey you. Woo! Mountain moving faith. That now I'm telling you, I don't know if you've ever looked at some of those big mountains like Grandfather Mountain in, our, in North Carolina. For me to tell that mountain to be moved and cast into the sea, which is 200 and some miles away, Jesus said that if I believe that in my heart and confess with my mouth and believe what I say would come to pass, I'd have what I say. No, you need a little, you just need faith of a mustard seed. 
Now, he doesn't want you to remain with muscle and faith. He wants your faith to grow. Amen? If faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, then you determine what kind of faith you have. Wow, wow. And I don't, that doesn't mean just hearing it without getting it in your heart. Right? Atheists can quote scriptures. It won't do them any good. They don't believe in it. I like to put it like this. Faith comes by perceiving and receiving into your heart as truth from the Word of God. Amen. Amen. The Word of God. Hallelujah. Faith can grow that way. Abraham did not weaken in faith, but he grew strong in faith. He could have weakened in faith, but he didn't. He grew strong in faith. Why? And he gave praise and glory. As he gave praise and glory to God, as he's reverberating back to what God told him, which is the Word of God, Every time Abraham went out and looked at the stars and said, so shall my seed be. Where did he get that from? From God. God told it to him. Amen. Why do we come together and, 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 and learn the word of God? Because it changes our life. Why we have been given this gift to go introduce Jesus to a lost and dying world because they need him. Not to put another notch on our belt. Hallelujah. And my main focus is not to get people saved. My main focus is to get them discipled. Come on, come on. Now, before you jump to conclusions, the first step of discipleship is get born again. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But too often we stop yes. at salvation and never train people to be disciples of Jesus. Come on, come on. Disciple means to discipline your life to be like him. Amen. If we're disciples of Jesus, our main passion is to be like him. People say, you're trying to be like Jesus. Well, absolutely, he told me to. We're supposed to, as a disciple, my goal was to be like him. Amen. To walk like him, talk like him, live like him, hear like him, speak like him. Come on, Heal like him, deliver like him. Oh, that's good Come on. Release peace Woo. like him. He, he even sent the disciples in these towns and said, now go into these towns and say, let your peace come upon them. Oh. The peace that we have. Unfortunately, too many believers are walking around looking for peace when actually we already have it. Why would you go look for something you already had? It's like me walking around looking for my wallet, put my hand in my pocket. Well, there's my wallet right there. It's been with me all the time. But because I didn't know it was there or didn't believe it was there, my mind raced to different places. How am I going to pay for this food? How am I going to get my gas? Whatever. Oh, wait a minute. My provision is with me. Let me just tell you. The provision that God longs for you to have, he's given it to you. Amen. Amen. Because Jesus said, it's finished. Woo. He was speaking prophetically. He spoke prophetically before the foundation of the earth because Jesus was a lamb slain before the world was ever created. Wow. Before the world was created, before there was dirt to form man to raise him up. Jesus had already determined and declared and ratified, I'm going to pay the price. Not only for your sicknesses and diseases, but for your sins. Come on, come on. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all my diseases, who, who, who forgives us all their sins, who redeems us from all sickness. Wow, come on, come on. Sin and sickness go hand in hand. Come on, come on. If you get rid of the sin problem, you get rid of the sickness problem. Oh, oh. If you know it and believe it. Amen? Amen. Amen? Jesus said, which is easier for me to say, that your sins are forgiven or that you're healed? In other words, guys, to let you know that I have the power on earth to forgive sins, I say this man, walk. Get up and walk. The man got up and walked. Why did he do that? To show them that he had the power to forgive sins. Where did sickness come from? The curse. You say, well, the curse of the law. Yeah, well, that was after the, the law was given. <laughs> yeah, but what Adam and Eve heard was the word of God, which was his direction, their truth. Their command, right? Amen. Don't eat of that tree because the day that you do, you shall surely die. Well, they ate of the tree. They didn't fall on the ground dead, but their spirit man was dead. 
Man, God cannot walk with them in the cool of the day anymore because his goodness, and God's goodness is so good that sin cannot stand in his presence. He is eternally good. Amen. He is gooder than you can ever imagine. Come on, come on. Again, I, I maybe said this last time we were together, but someone comes to Jesus and said, hey, good teacher. He goes, well, hold it. There's none good but God. Wow, wow. And I wanted to say, Jesus, can, can I ask you a question? He went about doing good, healing all the press of the devil because God's with you. There's none good but God? You've been pretty good. And the one that we consider to be extremely good says there's none good but God. Wow. It tells me that we can't imagine, we can't fathom how good God is. And if we who are evil know how to do, give good gifts to our kids, how much more would the Father give good gifts to them that love him, that belong to him? I doubt many people doubt God's power to heal. But many doubt his willingness to heal. And if you want to know the truth, I would imagine this is from F.F. F. Bosworth. It's not original with me, but it just really burns in my heart. I think he's probably would rather us believe he doesn't have the power to heal, but more than not having the willingness to heal. That's one leprous man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I know you have the power to, but I don't know that you're willing to heal me. And Jesus goes, of course I'm willing. And then he declares what he wants to come to pass, be healed. Amen. He spoke it into existence. <clears throat> His word is alive and full of power. And all the, his words and promises, we've been told by Gabriel that every promise from God has the power in it to bring it to pass. Amen. Amen. Every promise from God is full of power. Woo. Every promise is full of power. Yeah. Just, just because that word had power doesn't mean you and I get it, though. In another setting of the story, it talks about there were doctors of the law sitting by. And then it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. Wow, wow. You know, God won't make you get healed, though he longs for you to be healed. Amen. God won't make you get saved, though he longs for you to be saved. God so loved us that he gave his only son said, whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's love. He did something not even knowing for sure that you would come in. I mean, I know he knows all things. But there are many that don't come into his kingdom, and yet he still died for them anyway. Amen. Wow. He died knowing that some aren't coming. But he paid the price anyway. Wow. It would really be ridiculous and bad and Stupid on our part to die and go to hell when he paid a price for us not to go. Amen. Amen. In fact, our debt was covered and we paid it anyway. It'd be like someone paying off my house and I keep sending checks to the bank. <laughs> and if somebody pays off my house, I'm not going to send them any more money. Amen. And why in the world would we continue to pay for something that's already been paid for? Oh, that's a good word. Why would we not run to him to serve him knowing what he's done for us. Come on, come on. One day the, the blinders will be taken off and we'll see God for who he truly is. Amen. There is a deceiver on this earth going around to deceive you and I and he speaks to everybody to change the, all he really wants to do is dispel or to get you off of the word of God. Come on, come on. Just like we said in the garden, Eve came through the garden and the devil showed up as a serpent and said, hey, did God say you can't eat this tree? He asked a question. She said, yep. He said, don't eat it or don't touch it. For the day that we do, we shall surely die. And then Satan comes up and lies. He goes, you will not surely die. 
He just said something that was contrary to what God said. Guess whose word came to pass? God's. Why did God's word not save them? Because they didn't believe him. And they did something contrary to what he said. He sends us a word and heals us. Well, what if we don't receive that word? It won't do you any good. You know that like in that like that I was just talking about in that place where that man came in carried by four who by the time they carried their friend for so long, they said, well, we, we, we ain't coming all this way to get turned away. Either they're going to camp out until somebody leaves and they go in or they said, no, we ain't waiting any longer. We're going on the roof. But before they talked about that man coming, they talked about the people present in that house. And there was Pharisees and doctors of the law, scribes sitting in there, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. <clears throat> the power of the Lord can be present to heal, and you can miss it. But it's still present to heal. Anytime we gather in Jesus' name, he's here. Amen. It doesn't feel like it. doesn't always look like it. doesn't smell like it, taste like it. But it's true. He said, when two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Every Sunday, even if Jamie beats me to it, I'm going to say it again anyway, Jesus, we're gathered in your name. Because just that declaration ushers him in. He will always be here when we're gathered in his name. The only way that we can not believe that is to use our eyes or our sense realm perception to see if he's here. You're not going to see he's here unless he manifests himself. He doesn't always manifest himself, but he's still here. Come on, come on. And just in case you weren't sure, God's here too. Amen. Amen. We can't be anywhere apart from him because he's everywhere. Woo. What does that mean? Everywhere we go, no matter where we go, you can't escape him. There's not a place you can go to where you can't find, you, you can't even go to hell itself and he still, he still sees what's going on down there. You, you can't get away from it. But he's always there waiting for us to turn back to him, <clears throat> for us to come and draw towards him so he can draw near to us. He set a table before us in the presence of my enemies. Guess who's got to pick up the fork and eat? You and me. He's not going to spoon feed us. He'll spoon feed you as a, as a young Christian. But pretty soon he's going to expect you to do it on yourself. To start believing God for yourself. Amen. If this is the only time a week you get word of God, <laughs> you don't eat like that. You eat three times a day, seven days a week, unless you fast. Why would you only eat the word of God once a week? You should eat it every day. Every day. Come on, preacher. Come on. I try to endeavor to every morning to get up before anybody gets up so it's quiet and I have some quiet time with the Lord. And I, and I go to my desk, which is the same place I've been going for 20 years, and I call it the, my secret place. Well, it's, it's right out in the open. I sit in front of a window that people can see me from the street. Uh, there ain't no secret where I am, but it's a secret place in Him. But I can come over here and have a secret place with God. Just, God, you're right here with me. I can turn to him no matter where I am or where I'm going and he'll hear me. Woo! Hallelujah. And he'll answer me. Amen. I grew up most of my life not knowing that God will answer if you ask him. I was listening to some stuff on Brother Hagin recently. He's talking about different kinds of prayer. Because I know when we began to walk with the Lord in 94, which is next, next spring will be God, 30 years since we heard the truth of the word of God and all I want to do is go thank you go tell the world what I found out and I knew it was true because I was raised in a church I knew if this is true I can go back here and if it's there I know it's true Amen. The truth. can I say this Please. water baptism up here <laughs> this is the word of God it is applicable for life yes. we believe that in this church and in the body of Christ, that this is the inerrant, without, without mistake, without any errors, inerrant word of God. Hallelujah. And it has everything to do with our life. Amen. Every bit of it Amen. is applicable 
to our life. And if it's in there, it's true. Even if what's in here is different than what we see, this is still true. We are who God says we are. We have what God says we have. And we can do everything God says we can do. There's not one promise from God without the power inherent in it to bring it to pass. Every word from God is alive and full of power. That was the first thing that we heard. Brother Alred, Pastor Alred at First Methodist Church was teaching Sunday school class after he retired. And he went to Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is, is quick and powerful, sharp and a two-edged sword. And he talked about cutting your finger out of the quick. It means it's alive. Jesus goes, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. There's two things we draw on from God, his word and his spirit. Oh, come on, come on. You can't make it the way he wants you to without both of them. Spirit and truth, come on. But you really need to know the truth before you know the spirit. Because if you don't know the truth, you don't know how to judge the spirits that come. He's not the only spirit out there. And if you want to get technical, each one of us is a spirit being. But he is the God of all things. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One of the things I say every morning, God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then I go back to prayer in Ephesians 1. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are the God of my life. Jesus, you're Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, you're my teacher, my God. You live in me, and you show me what to do, and you teach me about Jesus. The words I speak into Jesus say they're spirit, and they are life. God's Holy Spirit is in his word. I can't separate them to a point of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. But they're one, but then they're three manifestations of how God is. And they talk to each other. And you know this, that the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, is interceding for you in behalf, and me on the behalf of our Father. Oh, thank you, Holy the Holy God. Spirit is talking to the Father about us. Wow. And so is Jesus. And Jesus is a man of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God said, that's my son with whom I am well pleased. Guess what that meant, if nothing else? He believes God. You know that when you believe God, you please the Lord without faith, it's impossible to please him? Wow, wow. We can't please him without faith. How do we please him? Believe him. His word, we believe it. Amen. Amen. Do not let the devil or this world or the things of this world talk you out of believing what God said. Oh. In fact, you got to get to the point you have to totally separate them such a degree that these things of this world seem silly and the things of God, the word of God <clears throat> becomes your, 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 just your rock that you stand on. Even if it look, even if you look stupid, believe in him. But you can't be because he'll use the foolish things to confound the wise. Things that are now following God is not foolish, but to the unbeliever, it looks like foolishness. But it's not foolishness to God. He'll use the things that look foolish to the wise to confound them. Wow! Wow! When you think you know everything. You're heading for trouble. <clears throat> Just read Proverbs. About every other day, it'll tell you. Don't think you know everything. The day that you do, you'll be in trouble. I know. I know. And we also have to be teachable. You always have to have your heart wide open. If you think you know something and it's wrong, everything that's connected with that thought or belief you had will be in trouble because it's not based on truth. Bill Johnson says it this way. 
Every area in your life where you have no hope and expectation of good, Bible hope is what faith works with. Amen. Bible hope is not wishful thinking, like, is it going to stay cool today, brother? Well, I sure hope so. I ain't hoping. I'm wishing because I saw the weather. It's going to be 90-something. Bible hope is not wishful thinking. Bible hope is a de deep, intense expectation of good. Good. In any area of your life where you have no hope, it's under the influence of a lie. Because every, every, every area of your life, God hasn't planned good for it. And even if you find yourself in a ditch, he's got a good plan to get you out. Physical, Mental or financial. Woo. Now we have folks that join us every week in Bible study, and folks that are financially in trouble. And I had one religious guy call me one day, says, do you, do you really think, do you believe in this prosperity message? I'm like, ah, I know where you're going with this. You, you're going to dispel it because some of the preachers out there look like they make a lot of money from it or whatever. Well, I would not even, I'm not going there, but does God want us to prosper? Yeah. He said, beloved, I wish you above all things. And the first thing was that you prosper. Come on, come on. And if you look at the blessings and cursings of the law, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and do that which is right in his sight, then all these blessings will come upon you. Blessed are you in the city. Blessed means empowered to prosper. You can be empowered to prosper, but not prosper. Why? Because you did nothing with what you were blessed with. <clears throat> but if you didn't know you were blessed, you'd doubly not. You first have to know you're blessed before you can be empowered to prosper by that blessing that you believe you have. Come on, come on. Don't think God's out there holding things back until you act right and you do things right so he can finally reward you with something. Because he's waiting for your reward. Hang it up. You ain't going to get one. We get his reward. Come on. His resurrection is our resurrection. His new life is our new life. His death is our death. But the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead dwells in us who believe. You have to, and belief is not something that you cannot control. The devil will make you think, well, you ain't, you ain't been doing this long enough to have enough faith. No. <laughs> Jesus dispelled that. All you need was this faith. But do you believe God? Do you choose to believe that what he says is true? Choice. Come on. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Wow. Wow. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let God know your request. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, peace is beyond your understanding. We're looking for peace that we can understand, but he wants it to be way beyond that. Woo! The peace that passes will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the rest that Hebrews is talking about in chapter 3 and chapter 4. Oh. Entering into this rest where you have no worries. Mm, that's good news. It's a good place to Do you be. know that you don't have a right to worry any more than you have a right to sin? You have a legal right, but not a moral right. And you can sin, you can worry if you want to, but guess what? It's sin. Because when he said, don't do it and you do it, guess what that is? Not obeying what he said. <clears throat> and it will legally, and the devil will see to it, <clears throat> that if you get yourself into sin and worry is one of them, well, the devil can keep you in bondage because of your worry. In fact, Brother Hagin said, it's the worst of all of them. There's some sins out there that are bad, but this, this worry thing will kill you. He said, I come from a family of good warriors. My mom and my grandma, they were, the, they were champion. They were world champion warriors. And I was right there with them. And then God got him one day. He said, you better quit worrying about this. Because when you worry about it, you're not trusting God. Because if you trust God, you don't worry. You want to find out if you're trusting God? See if you're worrying. Speaking to myself. Brother Hagin said, I, I found that out. He said, that was it. I didn't worry anymore. Something came. He said, I used to walk around them days and people say, well, how, and, and these are other preachers and they're going through the depression. How goes the battle? What battle? He says, it's going great. He said, they used to come to him later and say, man, we thought you were crazy because you said you never worried about nothing. He was doing what God told him to do. Amen. 
And if he can do it, guess what? You and I can do it. Come on, come on. You know that we can live without worry? Of course we can. We've been conditioned to think that if we don't worry, we're, we're being careless. Or we don't really have a heart. No. Worrying will make will perpetuate the problem. Come on. Worrying does not believe God's going to do what he said he would do. Let me see. Yesterday we listened to Brother Hagin said, you're getting a pity party. Well, you might as well quit that because it ain't going to do you no good. That won't do you a bit of good to worry. It won't give, do you a bit of good to fret and rub your hands and wring your hands and wonder why not. The world out there is not fair. Don't act like you think it should be. And the only victim we are is of the devil. But he's given us a far authority and power over him to defeat him. Jesus was in a particular healing circumstance in Luke 13. A man had a demon spirit. He couldn't talk. He'd been mute his life. Deaf and mute, one other gospel says. <clears throat> Jesus cast the devil out of him. Well, how do you know it was a devil and not physiological sickness? He's listening to the Father. He only does what he sees his Father do. He only does what his Father tells him to do. Somewhere the Father told him what to do. Now, if he told us to be like him, he's got to know that we're going to have to hear from God like he did. Come on. Right? Come on. We can't do what he did if we don't have what's available to him to do what he did. For us to go do what he's asked us to do to be like him. Amen. Amen. If he spoke to Jesus, he has to speak to us. Come on. Come on. I'll just say this. He's speaking to us all the time. Amen. You walk outside... Even in the midst of this heat, you can find beauty out there that he created, and you can go, God did this. Wow. God, in the midst of a storm, you can give God praise. Wow. Jesus slept in the back of a boat because he wasn't worried. And the, the disciples do exactly what we do. We ran to Jesus to fix the problem. And he goes, to them, when they woke him up, the boat's about full of water. It's about to sink. And they're about to die, they think. Yet Jesus is still asleep. Part of his body has to be floating in water. If the boat's about full and he's laying, he's not laying down above the boat, he's laying down in the boat. And if it's about to sink, Jesus is somewhere sloshing in water and he's still in peace. And they wake him up. In Matthew's account, he rebukes him before he gets up. It was more important to rebuke them than to fix the storm. Just like the father that brought his son to Jesus and that demon and that boy saw Jesus he threw him on the ground and began to wallow in the foam at the mouth and Jesus goes my goodness look at that how long has he been like this don't you want to fix it Jesus no no, no. I'm going to ask you how, how? I don't know how long he would have talked to him but he saw people come and he rebuked the devil and it came out Amen. he wasn't Amen. worried wow. he wasn't worried Look at all these people. What are we going to do with all these people? What have we got to feed them? You feed them. All we got is five loads and two fish. Yeah, that's all, that's all we need. If you take inventory before you begin what God calls you to, you'll never step. Oh, that's a good word. But what are, these among, what are these among so many? You feed them. Woo. You notice he didn't stop and laugh and say, oh, I'm just kidding. You know what can't feed them with that five loads and two fish? There were no limits. There's no limit with you and God. Hallelujah. You can say, well, I've been in the, I've been in the street five years. So, change it. He wants you to prosper and be in health. Now, if he was just going to dump it on you just because you were living on this earth, you'd have had it by now. There's a God side and a man side to everything. Wow, wow. When you find out what God side was, and you find that our side is not so hard. All the promises of God are the outcome of faith and depend entirely on faith. How does faith come? By hearing him by the word of God. You can't just sit there and get faith by not listening to the word of God. Come on, come on. And these promises that you need fulfilled won't be fulfilled without faith. On, that means you got to put your nose in this book. Oh. you got to put this word in your heart. Oh, 
getting a wobbly up here. <clears throat> On the day of Pentecost, Peter came out and said, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You men, old men have seen visions, young men have seen dreams. I'm still seeing dreams. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. And I will write their, my words in their heart and in their mouth. Oh, thank you, Lord. But you got to put it in there. Thank you, Jesus. He will write it. Do you know I have never tried to memorize scripture? Except the 23rd Psalm when I was in vacation Bible school at Pilgrim Holiness Street. It's down on South Hamilton Street behind the Ilderton Dodge dealership when my grandma went, my mom, my mom went to church. They were, they were holiness, but they didn't believe in no miracles. My, my grandfather on my daddy's side was Pentecostal holiness. They believed in the power of God. Them two groups didn't get along. The, the, the in-laws didn't see eye to eye, so my mom and dad went to the First Methodist Church. It's where I grew up. But you know they were on to the truth? <clears throat> On the day that Pentecost was, 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 came, God poured out a spirit, and he now writes his words in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank and those you. words are weapons against the enemy that we Amen. battle. I'll say this one other scripture, then we'll pray, and then we'll take communion. <clears throat> I'm not thinking which one I was going to tell you. Uh, man, what was it, Lord? He wants us to know his truth. Hebrew starts off, in the days of old, our fathers were spoken to by the in and by the prophets, but in the last days he's spoken to us in the person of a son. Amen. Ever since God created us, he's been speaking to us. Amen. Why? Because his word is truth and his truth will free us. His, his truth will keep us free. Amen? Hallelujah. Can I get that verse back? Oh, me. <clears throat> it was a good one. Well, there are no bad ones, right? <sighs> Hallelujah. I got it. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Jesus is in a synagogue another Sabbath day, not Sunday, from somewhere between Friday night dawn, when darkness, twilight, until Saturday when the sun goes down. That's the Sabbath. Now every day is a Sabbath. He's there and he noticed in the back of the meeting house there was a woman that was bowed together and could no wise lift up herself. Bowed, not, bowed, not humped over, not hunchback, but bowed together like a wow. clothespin or like a paper clip. Wow. She's folded over. Like Karen's family talks about making a fold over sandwich, she put Stuff on one side and fold the bread over. She was folded together and could not otherwise lift up herself. And he called her to him. And she came forth somehow. I don't know how she got there. She had to walk backwards or somebody had to help her. But she got in front of Jesus. He says, woman. Now, he is not assessing the situation with his visual sense or his eyes or his ears. He's judging her from the kingdom realm of God because of her inheritance. Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. When he said that, she was bowed over. He said something contrary to what he saw. You're always going to have to speak God's word regardless of what you see. If you speak what you see, you'll have what you say. If you say what you see, you're going to perpetuate the situation that you have. <clears throat> it 
Jesus was never moved by the situation. Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And then he laid hands on her and she was made straight and glorified God. But he called it into being, called those things that be not as though they were. And the rule of the synagogue got mad. He was mad because he healed on the Sabbath day. He said, you, he said, there are six days in which men ought to work, not the Sabbath day. Come any day to be healed, not the Sabbath. And Jesus goes, you, out loud, you hypocrite. Don't you take your donkey and your ox down to the water on Sabbath day and give them water? And not, not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, low these 18 years. Satan has bound this woman for 18 years, and because she's a daughter of Abraham, she ought to be free, Woo! you hypocrite. That tells me one thing, that in Abraham's promises, healing's in there. Amen. Amen. We may not have seen where it was written, but he said, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. Well, you can't be blessed and empowered to prosper if you're sick. Come on. I'm going to bless you, Abraham. And somewhere in all of God's blessings, in that blessing lies our healing. In that mercy, in that freedom, in that covenant we have with God lies our freedom. Because she was a daughter of Abraham. God came through Abram, who became Abraham, who God called. He finally got in line, an agreement with God some 25 years later and became everything God declared back in Genesis 12 to become everything God declared he would be. Amen. He's looking at Abram and goes, now you're going to be this compared to what I see. He's always speaking. And in your life, he's always speaking to you to bring you up to a higher level, to walk in his fullness, to represent his kingdom to reach the world. Amen. Wow. We talked about the blessings and cursings of the law in Deuteronomy 28. Go spend some time there. First 1 through 14 talks about the blessings. But if you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, you're going to have to listen to God. Amen. If you don't, these curses will come upon you themselves. God's not going to put them on you. We're living in a world which is maintained by the word of God. God's word is in total control, but God is not in control of everything that happens on this earth. Come on. Because there's free will agents like you and me, and now the devil who does what he wants, contrary to what he's going to pay because he's not listening to God. And we don't want to go with him. Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. We, we were due the curse of the law, but Jesus became the curse for us. But it didn't happen when the law came. It happened when humanity fell and God started looking for someone to move through, to send his son through, to pay the price, to fulfill what was declared before the world was ever built or created. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. According to Deuteronomy 28, 61, every sickness and every disease listed in this book or not in this book, that's under the law. Every sickness and every disease is a curse of the law. How about the sickness disease got there before that? The first law that was broken, curse came in. Come on. The written law and the non-written law, it's written for us, but in Abraham and Adam's day, it was what God said. And when you transgress God's word, you open up oblivion for Satan and his kingdom to come after you. But we have the blood of Jesus over us to keep us and hold us and bring us back to where we should be in restoration in the kingdom of Satan. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of law being made a curse for us because it's written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Woo! And then verse 29, this is where you ought to shout because you... Just like this woman that was bowed together, no, uh, no wife lifted up herself. Jesus said, you ought to be healed because you're a daughter of Abraham. Come on, come on. In verse 29 of Galatians 3, it says, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, if, that, God, if, that woman, if that woman that was bowed together, legally she'd be healed because she's a daughter of Abraham, then you and I should be healed because we belong to Christ and we're Abraham's seed and heirs to the court of the same promise that she had and Abraham had. Amen. Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. And by his stripes, 
we were, not going to be tomorrow. We are now. We have as our inheritance our healing. Amen. 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 We know our sins are taken care of. And Jesus said, which is easier to say. It's just as easy for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven and you're healed. And it's just as easy for me to say to you because my master and my Lord, my king said it, which is easier to be saved to be healed. It's the same. It's not a mystery. It's a, it's a price that's been paid for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to, I called Kelly yesterday and we have these books that Derek Prince Ministry sows into this ministry for you. And they should be available at Bible study, which Michael, you're teaching, or whoever's teaching Bible study, Kelly and, and Jamie, Bonnie. We should offer every time people to come into the kingdom. Amen. I, I can't remember who it was, Bert, who's working with us. I'll, I'll find out and give you more specifics, but he said, this one guy is talking about charitable work that you do in the kingdom. He says, you don't really have to be a believer to give food away, to give clothing, or to help people get, I mean, you can help people not be a believer. Just because you do that doesn't mean you're a Christian. But, but we are commanded to go do that. It's not like we don't have an option, but in fact, heal this, I mean, to take care of the widows, orphans, and the poor is a mandate for the church, not for this, this church, but all churches. We give a platform for a lot of people to work through to join us in the Dream Center to do that because it's not easy to go start one if you don't have one, but you can work with the body of Christ to take care of the widows, orphans, and the poor. Amen. But that's not a reward we have. That's our duty. This is like in Romans 12, it says, do these things nice because that's just your reasonable service. I mean, that's our reasonable service. If God says do it, guess what? It's our reasonable service to obey him. Come on. Right? But he said, go make disciples of men. In that Luke 13, when that guy was mute and couldn't speak, Jesus said, this is a war. And if you, whoever's not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather the spoils with me. And he describes in that passage that Satan stands guard over his kingdom of a mighty fortress of weapons that he has until someone comes along stronger than him and binds him up and takes the spoils. What was the spoils he took in that circumstance? That man that was mute and deaf began to speak. He cast the devil out for the spoil. His spoil was not funds, it was humanity. Setting the captives free. And Jesus said, if you don't set the captives free with me, you'll be scattered. We're called to go tell the truth and make disciples of men. We're also called to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out, and also called to take care of the widows, orphans, and the poor. They're not mutually exclusive. Come on, come all together. On. So, to finish this guy's thought that I told you about a second ago, you can do all that stuff and not be a believer. But as believers, we're given the privilege to introduce Jesus in relationship, personal relationships with Jesus to humanity. Hallelujah. We are given that privilege. Non-believers can't do that. <laughs> the church could do that. We represent his kingdom and everything that his kingdom represents. And we have the full backing of his kingdom because our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. That's the true source, Jesus said, of our authority. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So today, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, I want to lead you in a prayer. Maybe you got saved when you were young. And those online, I'm talking to you just as well. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then are you saved. God commands us to go share the good news of this kingdom. And in Jesus' time, when he would share the good news of the kingdom, people were healed, delivered, and set free. They come together. So if you never made that prayer, before, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you'd be so bold, everybody just bow your heads. If you, if you would be so bold to stand up, if you're going to pray this prayer today, I'd love to lead you in this prayer. If you'd like Jesus to be Lord of your life, change your life. Let him take over your life and co-labor with him to change the world. If that's you, I want you to stand at your feet.
if you're listening online, and all believers together with me, pray this prayer out loud with your mouth. Repeat that to me. Heavenly Father, I've heard your gospel truth. Today I declare Jesus is Lord of my life. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And according to your word and my profession of faith, I'm now saved. Now take my life and do something with it. Father, you also said that if I ask you, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Just like you did for Jesus in the baptism of John. So fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. And I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you, if, you, if you pray that prayer for the first time or you rededicated your life this morning, I want you to see us right after the church service. There's one book on complete salvation. It tells you how to get started on your walk with, your, with the Lord Jesus as Lord of your life. And then this one, immersion in the Spirit, being filled with God's Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, just like the day of Pentecost, to go do the works for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. One more thing I'm going to pray for, then we'll take communion. We're going to pray for the sick or those afflicted, oppressed, depressed, in bondage mentally or physically, through addictions, anything that is holding us back from being all that God has called us to be. I want you to stand to your feet. And if you have cancer in your body or someone in your family has cancer, I'm going to come and curse cancer first. If you have cancer, someone in your family or somebody you know has cancer, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to speak to the cancer in their bodies. Jesus said we could speak to a fig tree and it would die. He spoke to the wind, the waves, and they stopped. He spoke to a fever that was in Peter's mother-in-law. He spoke to leprosy and it left. He declared things into being. And Jesus told us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. In addition to that, if you have any other sickness, any disease, any kind of torment, any kind of mental issues, physical issues, any kind of addictive issues, perverted issues, things that you, things you can't break off yourself, that you feel like you're held captive, I want you to stand to your feet. God wants you to be free. Amen. God wants you to walk in divine health. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Peter, by the Holy Spirit, said, be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, goes about incessantly like a roaring lion looking for his prey to devour. He is not a roaring lion. He would have you think he's a roaring lion. We don't fear him. All he is is a liar. And if he tells you something, laugh because the opposite's true. If he tells you you're sick, say, hallelujah, I'm healed. Take a decisive stand against him and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. For you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kind of troubles that you endure. We endure these troubles. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when I, call you, when I tell you to, call the name out, your name or whoever you're standing for. I've got a list of names. I'm going to call that as well. But we're going to curse the cancer in their bodies and then we're going to pray for every sickness and Release God's kingdom realm in our midst. And it travels through airways just like the centurion who came to Jesus and miles away because of what they spoke in one place changed that young man's life. Amen. Amen. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority given to us as ambassadors of his kingdom, and because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's the true source of our authority, we curse the cancer cells that are physically in the bodies of the people's names we call out right now. Call your name out or whoever. Mary, Lisa, Cameron, Jill, Marty, Taylor, Allie, Amy, Margie, Carolyn, Adora, RM, Betsy, Miss Davis, Nina, Susan, Gina, Phil, Olivia, Lee, Tony, Marcia, Thomas, Bob. 
cancer in these bodies, we curse you to your very core and we command you to die. Cease and desist your maneuvers now and come out of these bodies in Jesus' name. If this cancer that's in these bodies happens to be not physiological but, but demonic, Jesus told us that believers would cast out devils. And we are believers and we cast devils out. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you foul unclean spirits of cancer, we command you loose them and let them go now in Jesus' name. Furthermore, if there's any cancer in this room or in the sound of my voice, we don't even know what's in there yet. Maybe it's so small it hadn't even formed into a mass. We don't have to wait till it gets too big. Every cancer cell within the sound of my voice, we curse it to its very root. Whether it's physiological or it's demonic, it has to come out. We command you root out of their body, come out and die in Jesus' name. And for every other sickness, every other disease, any kind of mental tor torment, any kind of mental issues, any kind of cerebral issues, physical issues, neurological issues, blood issues, sugar issues, heart issues, organ issues, skin issues, bones, eyes, ears, <clears throat> any of our sense realm perception where it's becoming dull, we speak life to every cell of our body. We speak freedom, deliverance from evil. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we say be healed from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. Every cell, every tissue, every fiber of your being alive with the life of God, functioning in the perfection in which God created to function. I forbid any malfunction in our body in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. When you have a testimony, please let us know. There's testimonies on Friday nights when we go out in the streets. There's been testimonies in Bible study. There's been testimonies in here. Things that happen. I will say this, just to give you one hint on this. Y'all can be seated if you like. We've been cursing cancer ever since my brother-in-law. My, my, my brother died. Not my brother-in-law. My brother, who's two years younger than me, died of cancer. And I said, that's it. I'm, I'm sick of this cancer mess. And now there's people we know, good friends on that list, that we're fighting for them against. We're fighting to take a decisive stand against Satan. Because we, we can whip him with faith. Amen. I'm tired of it. So the Lord said, just every time you minister, curse cancer. That's what we do. Because it took my father and my brother. But there's people that are standing in faith to believe in God. Amen. Amen. He longs for us to be whole and to be free. Amen. He's paid it. We got to let him get what he paid for. Amen. Well, on the last night that he came together with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it and held it up and says, this is my body that was broken for you. Think about his body broken for us. By his stripes, we were healed. His body was broken for our sins, for our generational curses, and for the peace, the chastisement that was needful to obtain our peace and well-being was laid on him. Whatever price had to be paid so that you and I could walk in peace was laid on him. Woo. That's what you did. That's what you told us to remember, Jesus, when we came together. This is your body that's broken for us. We do this as often to remember and call you affectionately into remembrance of everything you said in your name. And then he took the cup. And he held up the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood. Jesus appeared to Mary at the tomb and a couple other ladies. He said, don't handle me yet. I haven't been to my father. He goes to the heavenly holy of holies and pours his blood on the mercy seat. And then comes back and says, now handle me. His blood. We plead the blood of Jesus over our circumstances, over our lives, over our health, over our peace, yes. over our finances. Yes. Because his blood is a guarantee for everything that God had covenanted with his son. And we partake in that covenant. This is your blood, blood, Jesus, it was shed for us in this blood covenant. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, but your blood was shed once and for all to bring us back into the right relationship with the Father where his will comes to pass that we be a
prosper and be in health, even as our soul prosper. We do this to call your affectionate remembrance of everything you told us. We declare this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Amen. That's good news. It is. That's the best news I know. Hallelujah. Again, if you gave your life to the Lord today and you one of these books, come up here and get one after we finish, and then the one on the Holy Spirit. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, what are you waiting on? Amen. You're not waiting on God. Stand to your feet. Thank you for coming today. It's a blessing to be with you. We will not have, we will not have Bible study tomorrow because of the 4th. We'll be back on Wednesday afternoon, okay? Tomorrow, Wednesday at King's Kitchen. But the thing my heart desires more than anything else is you find out who you are in God and you become everything God's destined for your life. Amen. And it's far over and above all that you could dare ask, think, or pray, or dream. He longs for good things to happen in your life. You can't be too blessed with God. Amen. And he blesses you with the blessing of Abraham to go bless someone else. Amen. Amen. When you find out this truth, go tell the world. Go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to faithfully follow every command God gave the first 12. Whatever their commands are, there's ours. And if you go study that, it'll wake you up. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Lift up his countenance means he lifts up your chin and puts face to face with you because God longs to walk face to face with you and me. The Lord bless you and keep you. He's always trying to bless us. He's already blessed us. He talks about the blessing all the time. In case people don't know it or hear about it, they can step into it. He keeps sending his word to bless us, to bless us. Make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen, amen. Good to be with you this Sunday. Love you. See you here next week. Bring somebody with you. We love you. God bless you. Thank you again for being our guest here on The Voice of Healing. When you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, join us for our 10 a.m. Sunday morning service. Our website, restoringplace.org, has all the details on how to find us. While you're on our site, check out ways you can volunteer at the Dream Center. Need someone to answer questions about us or to pray with you 24-7? Call our prayer line at 704-904-9025.